Are you surprised by Illinois? You shouldn't be. I'm here with head coach Shauna Green to talk about it. Lockdown Women's Basketball starts now. Ogumba Wallet for the win. You are Locked On Women's Basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Lockdown Women's Basketball. I'm your host, Howard Magdal. Thank you for making us your first listen every day. We are, of course, here for you six days a week, all things women's basketball, coming to you Monday through Friday, and then Saturday, of course, also the WNBA Draft Show. Make sure you're tuning in. Make sure you're tuning in not just to my shows, but to everything that we do over at thenexthoops.com, where we have over 100 recorded pieces Every month, the nexthoops.com, incredible resource for covering women's basketball. And so as a result, we have been on the Shauna Green train for a very long time. Our A-10 reporter, Natalie Heverin, has been writing about you and the success you had there. We had a terrific in-depth feature from Eric Reinston Lobel talking about the fact that if you were surprised by Illinois, you shouldn't have been. So we're going to get into why, but Coach, just I'm glad you're here. When and how quickly did you know that you were going to be able to come together with this kind of success, 14 and three ranked, doing all of the things that perhaps the national uh, media didn't see you coming? Uh, Thank you, Howard, for everything you said and the kind words and and for having me on. You know, this team, it just kind of developed. I don't know if there's a time or, you know, uh, I didn't know how quickly we could develop. Um, You know, we kind of obviously I got the job in late spring and, and then, you know, had five returners and, and added some, you know, a couple transfers or a few transfers. And, and, you know, I give our kids a ton of credit just with how, you know, they really bought in uh, from day one and, and how they also took ownership and the relationship piece this summer of really just trying to you know we're on a new team, we're a new staff and, and trying to get to know each other off the court so we could do the things that we wanted to on the court. So, you know, I, I never put a time, you know, table on any of this. You know, in my press conference, I said, you know, we'll be good when we're good because I, I don't know when that'll be. Um, and just really, really give a ton of credit to our players. You know, they're the ones that are out there that that make plays. They're the ones that, you know, are, are the ones that work in every single day and, and buying in. And, and just it, this group has been an absolute joy to be around and to coach from from day one. It's interesting. You know, we we covered your initial press conference and you said this at that time back in March about the Big Ten. I've always thought this was the conference that really fits me. It's an unbelievable lead with some of the best coaches in the country. It's going to be really, really tough every single night. So I want the challenge of being able to play against the best night in and night out. I think it's pretty clear that the Big Ten is the best conference in college basketball this year. Would you agree with that? I mean, I'm biased, obviously, but I, I, be, I believe that it is. It's just, it's, and I haven't even, I'm what, six games in, and, and I feel like I'm 60 games in. I mean, it is an absolute grind every single night. Um, and, and we really do, like any competitor as a player or as a coach, right? You want to play against the best and you want to be challenged every single, every single day, every single time you step on the floor. And, and we get that in this league. We have some of the best coaches you know, to ever coach the game and, and just some of the best players that, that we're competing against every night. I know you know that lead inside out for a bunch of reasons, you know, not only growing up in Iowa and being able to see Big Ten games, but being able to coach on Joe McEwen's staff as a result of it. Um, did seeing it through Joe's eyes give you a sense of what this Illinois job could be? You know, he's just obviously being that that – growing up in the big 10 and then obviously uh, being on his staff for, for that season. And it got a little taste of, of what this conference is about. And, and, and coach has just been such a great mentor person that I can, you know, friend that, that I can, you know, bounce things off. And, and we talked, you know, about the job too. And, and he thought that this job uh, people could win here. Like he really believed in this job and, and, you know, and, and I, I agreed with him. So uh, he's just a, just a great person. I learned a lot in a short period from him as a basketball coach, but more importantly, uh, I learned about, 
just that that is a good man and with a great family who really cares about his players, but more importantly, he really cares about his his staff too and and how we do and and our success after we leave his program. Winning is one thing, and obviously that's the paramount thing. But I think what our listeners ought to know is how much fun it is to watch your teams play. You know, just want to throw a couple of numbers out there and you can give me a sense of how much those skills were part of your inspirational speech in a pizzeria this summer and how that contributed. Uh, The first thing is that you are eighth in the country in points per 100 possessions. So 111.9, you know, in a league with Iowa, you are managing to quite literally out Iowa, Iowa, as you did in a big win uh, just recently, which is significant in and of itself. But you took a team that shot a little over 31% from three last year, and you guys are 41.3%. You are, you know, essentially to use a Midwesterner, although Big East Midwesterner, you guys are a collective Valley Quigley from three so far in this season. Um, How much was getting people bought in uh, the fact that you come with a track record of success and how much of it comes from the fact that you were able to, you know, sell your players on an idea of like, look how much fun you're going to have while we're doing it. I think that's key. I, I really do. Like, you know, at the end of the day, like we, we want to win games, but guess what? Winning's fun. So <laughs> like and, and working really, really hard together should be fun. So that's always been a staple in our programs uh, is, is, Hey, we're going to work really, really hard. We want to, you know, we're going to have high, high expectations and standards, but I want to have fun doing this. And I think that that is, is key to success. Um, and, and our players, again, like it, it was kind of amazing just how from day one with the returners, obviously day one, when I was here, the, the transfers weren't here. So mm-hmm. day one, it was those, you know, we, we ended up getting those five that decided to stay with us and, and how bought in they were from the star is it, just it really is amazing because they didn't, they don't have to be that way. Right. Like they didn't, I say it to everyone, they didn't come to Illinois to play for Shauna green. So for them to just completely say, coach, let's go. We're eager. We want to, we want to do this. We want to win. They wanted to be great. They, they were so hungry to have success. So they were, they were easy. They, they, anything we said in practice, anything we were, you know, we were working on their shots and, and tweaking their shots right away, you know, to, you know, with details and technique and footwork, and they didn't question any of it. And and I think you know that that kind of accelerated maybe some of the 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 process because they were just so bought in to start. It, it makes a lot of sense, and it is it, you know before we get into some of the particulars, some of the individuals who are so key to this turnaround. I just think it behooves everyone to understand it isn't as if your teams historically have played any one way you know the the thing you'd hear from a10 opponents is oh my god we got to deal with dayton's defense i mean you are a top 20 program by opposition points per possession uh consistently at dayton you know right up to your final year there and so it does seem in a certain way that you know sure there are some overlaps but just my my favorite my most interesting one is that at dayton you were 264th in pace in division one last year and now you're top 125 you you know you it seems like you've molded your approach here to personnel just take me through how you came to that decision you know those are interesting numbers howard i'm glad you gave me those um i I need to call you more often and get numbers so (laughs) you know at at date it's it literally we did not change one thing from from date and philosophy to here nothing from we defend first then we want to rebound and then we want to run and we've been like you nailed it the last six years we've been a top you know 25 team in defensive field goal percentage and also defensive rebounding and and that leads to us being able to play really really fast in our phoenix transition where we're trying to score you know in six seconds or less if we can and then we'll get it out and run our stuff and we got a ton of different things we do in the half court but you know we're just that's been probably, and I don't have an answer to it. Even our staff were like, it's like, it's kind of amazing. We're like, we've always, we thought and and talked about playing fast when we were at Dayton, but now we're actually playing a heck of a lot faster and and able to to do a lot of things that, you know, have always been in our philosophy, but I think the numbers now are kind of backing it up from the offensive end. And and we're always going to hang our hat on our defense. Like that is who we are. That is like, what you know we've won a lot of games and we've won championships because of our defense so that is not going to change but 
Um, it's been pretty uh, astonishing, I think, to, to me and our staff, uh, the offensive numbers and, and how those have come along pretty quickly. It's interesting. And so I want to get into because so much of defense comes from continuity. So much of it comes from communication. So let's get into that because that gets to my next idea, which is that it seems like there's another level for you guys. Um, I do first want to talk to our listeners about Built Bar. And Built Bar is a sponsor of this program, but Built Bar is personal to me. Built Bar is the way in which I'm later today driving down to the NWSL draft in Philadelphia. How am I going to get there? Uh, I'm going to get there because I'm going to be eating Built Bars along the way. It's made with real chocolate, but it only has 130 calories, four grams of sugar with 17 grams of protein. And by the way, used to be you could only get it at Built.com. Now you don't need to wait around to get a box. You can go at your local Walmart, your local Sam's Club. I can tell you the cookie dough is delicious. Uh, my younger daughter specifically asked me for a snickerdoodle yesterday. So head to your nearest Walmart today, walk into the pharmacy section, and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. If you're close to Sam's Club, you can do the same thing. They've got a 13-bar box. Brownie batter and churro, highly recommended. Brownie batter is my wife's favorite. You can thank me later. Built Bar, make sure you tell them Grandma Myrna sent you. So back to the idea of defense. You guys, when you look at those numbers, you take it inside. Defensive rebounding, you're top 30 in the country. Overall, defensive points per possession, it's actually lagging a bit. It's actually around 120th, which is sort of a strange thing to say about a team that's had this much of a turnaround. But does it feel to you like 14-3 and three is great, but there's another level that you guys are able to reach this year? I totally agree. And, and, you know, we're, I never get too caught up. I'm more a defensive percentage uh, person mm -hmm. instead of points, but you know, we also gave up, I mean, when you're playing Iowa, Ohio States, I mean, we've given up 90 and, and, you know, whatever, 80 some, like those are I, like my, our teams, we're just not used to giving up that many points, but you also, you know, I, you have Caitlin Clarks and, and, you know, Taylor, Mike sells and just unbelievable players that are, that are able to put up 30, you know, a, a piece, but we need to, I think. And, and one thing that, you know, we really, this is our bye week One thing we've gotten back to this week in practice is our, our principles and the basics of our defensive philosophy. Mm -hmm. We, I, I thought the last few games, we haven't been as sharp defensively of just doing our, our core, our core values and, and, and being a lead in our principles. And, so that's where we've really kind of gotten back to basics this week. But I totally agree with you that we can we can ramp it up more. We can be better defensively, uh, and, and we need to be, to be quite frank with it. We have to be better defensively if, if we want to continue getting wins in this conference. We just, we've had too many breakdowns um, in the last couple games, and, and, and I know we will bounce back, but we gotta we got to get back to that. You have in Kendall Bostick, somebody who's, stuck around somebody who's been obviously a critical part of what you're doing and her ability to block shots is obviously a differentiator for you at that end how much does that come from finding people to buy in in that same way and how much of this just comes down to you know like the way your dating team would play it was it was like um you know in a video game a single joystick controlling all five players at once how much does it need to look like that it's another great analogy I'm going to use. So um, we, we talk about it all that time. We talk about five people guarding the ball all the time, moving together. And, and when we're not doing that and we're just playing one-on-one -on -one or letting, you know, putting our teammates out in an island defensively, we are not at our best. That is not our defensive philosophy is, is five people guarding the ball, keeping them in front, for, keeping them out of the paint and forcing them into tough twos mm -hmm. uh, and having everything contested. So yeah, that's that is our goal to get everyone moving in the same direction, communicating on an elite level. And when we're the, when we are doing that, we can we can guard. Uh, you know, I truly believe we can guard anyone in the country. So we get we just got to get back and be a little bit sharper with that and, and going into this next uh, next you know set of games. Mm -hmm. In terms of the lineups that you've had, you know, one significant change of late. Um, I, I did not so recently, but is Genesis Bryant coming in and being a starter for you over the last six games? She's obviously been incredibly productive, uh, four games, 20 plus points in her six times in the starting lineup. Take me through kind of how you viewed her as a contributor coming over from NC State and then just, you know, you know what led to that 
uh, decision to push her into the starting lineup uh, over the last half dozen games. Yeah, you know, Genesis, you know, obviously we had recruited her at Dayton and, and, you know, she had told us no and went to NC State. So when she got into the transfer portal, we knew we knew what type of person we was. We knew her her character, her work ethic. We knew what type of player she was. And obviously we knew she fit what we wanted to do because we had to try to recruit her before. Uh, so that was a no brainer for us. So I knew what she was. She was capable of. Now, the thing was. She really didn't play for two years at NC State. So right. she had to come, and I give Jen a lot of credit because she came this summer, and and she had to work. Like, she had to get herself back. She had to get, get you know, get herself back into to the playing condition that she needed to be in. She needed to get her confidence back and, and kind of get that swag back to her. And it took some months. It took some some time. and and But now, I mean, she's just playing at a high, high level with extreme confidence and you know, my decision to not start her, start her, you know, I say with with this team, with really every team I've been a head coach with, we've always I made some decisions with bringing some people off the bench that really could be starters. Sure. Uh, you know, last year with our Dayton team, I brought Jenna Jaconi off the bench, who was first team all conference the year before and a six year senior because I just like that production, you know, that that she had. Same thing here, you know, early on, I just really liked having Jen and, and Jada coming off the bench because they gave us an instant spark. Mm -hmm. Then we had a couple injuries and, and or a couple, not injuries, a couple of people being sick and, and some lineups change. And then I'm like, okay, let's go with uh, Jen and, and Makaira both out there to start and bring Jayla and Jada off the bench. So it, it's not, I don't really overthink that stuff. I don't want our players to overthink it. I just want them to be ready when they go in uh, to the game and, and they've all taken all of it. Great. You know, they, they know questions. They, they believe in what we're doing. And, and I just, you know, it could change again. You know, I don't, I don't know. It could change again throughout the year, but right now um, I, I like this lineup and I, I like having Jayla and Jada coming off the bench now. In terms of Makaira, and I'm glad you brought her up, Makaira Cook, who has been an absolute uh, force for you guys, just so our listeners know, 18.3 points per game, and again, huge efficiency numbers, 42.4 from three on over four attempts per game. I assume it was a pretty free-flowing conversation uh, with Makaira between you guys and uh, her former staff over at Dayton from last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you know, with Makara, if you know her, and I've said this multiple times, she's just the most loyal person. And when she trusts you, she trusts you. And and I just think with her, you know, and those are things that that were hard, really hard for me to make the decision to leave Dayton because I feel like I'm a loyal person, and and I I recruited those kids there, and I love that place. Like I love University of Dayton, and, and always will. And so it was really, really hard for me to make that decision to leave. So, you know, when I told them that, that I was leaving that morning, you know, that was the hardest, hardest decision I've had to make in a long, long time, if ever. Um, and, and then there really wasn't a conversation with Makaira. It was just like, she trusts me. And, and she, she said she wanted to come with, like, there was no conversation. It was no, like, Oh, come with me. It was coach. Like right away. I was coach. I'm going to come with you. Like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, so, I think that that's maybe a piece that sometimes people might, that aren't in the business might not understand that it wasn't like the relationships and the trust and, and all that goes into the recruiting process. And then when you've coached someone for two years, she, she loved Dayton, just like I love Dayton, but she felt the best thing for her was to come here. And um, you know, so that there wasn't a, it really wasn't a conversation and, and, you know, just, just a loyal, loyal kid that, um, is taking advantage of an unbelievable opportunity and, and playing at a, at a very high level. Yeah. I mean, it's a business of relationships, so, you know, like so many are, so yes. it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to get into uh, a little bit about sort of your medium longer range vision. Um, first do need to make sure that our listeners are aware of, and go ahead and grab that of LinkedIn jobs uh, LinkedIn jobs, it's just vital. If you're a small business owner or hiring manager, you have the opportunity to use LinkedIn jobs to get your best candidates for it. Uh, we recently added two beat reporters over at The Next, uh, covering a couple of different WNBA teams and being able to post at LinkedIn jobs 
allowed me to hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help us achieve our goals. That's particularly important in women's basketball, where there needs to be an understanding that, yes, this is uh, something to cover, but it's also a movement, and it's something uh, vital at this time. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. So LinkedIn Jobs, you can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So I get it. You're a Midwest product and grew up in Illinois, or grew up in Iowa, excuse me, or there in Illinois now. But we almost had you on the East Coast. We had you for a while. You know, when you played at Canisius, uh, one of the best players, if not the best player in, in program history, uh, when you were coaching over at Providence. Do you miss the East Coast at all? Or, or has the Midwest just always had your home? <laughs> I actually do miss uh, the East Coast. I Some of Five, I was at Providence five years and my husband would agree. Those were some of, you know, our, our best years out there. We absolutely love the New England area. Um, I love all the people at Providence College. It's, you know, it's just that small uh, school, tight knit family atmosphere that, that I just I really, really enjoyed our time. We have some really good friends that we've made, you know, out that way. And, and I do, I, I do miss that. I, I miss it out there, but I guess I, you always come back to, kind of, you know, where you started and, and what's what's true to your heart. And I guess that's the the Midwest in me. But, um, you know, growing up and, and in high school, I had I said that I'm like, I'm getting out of Iowa. I'm getting out of the Midwest. That's why I went to play out on the East Coast. And and then look where I end up. I end up back back home. <laughs> our, our, our roots are with us forever. I know. <laughs> it, you know but so we, we, we graciously give you back to the Midwest along with KBA at Michigan. We'll it's okay. It will, we'll, we'll continue to cover all the best uh, conference, and it is clearly the best conference in, in college basketball. I don't think that is in dispute. Um, the last place I just want to take our listeners today is just your vision for this, and, and, and I think it's fair to say that the success you're having here in year one has a lot of people thinking about what Illinois can be as a power. But to do that in the Big Ten, quite frankly, even compared to five years ago, where Maryland ruled the roost and you had a little bit of Ohio State, Iowa on occasion, but it was not the way it is now where you just look up and down the line. And boy, I, I, I don't envy you and the scouts uh, <laughs> that you have to put together in the weeks ahead. But like, what does success look like? And just, you know, I just want to frame it this way. At University of Tennessee, there are a lot of fans in the fan base who talk about how do we get back to what Pat Summit did? And I've, I've often said, that's impossible. Pat Summit did that at a game at that time that was simply not nearly as deep as, you know, just the SEC is now, let alone, uh, you, you know, nationwide. What does success for a major program at Illinois look like now in your view? No, I think, I think you're right. You know, it, first off, sustained success is just so extremely hard. It, it, and it's getting harder and harder, you know, and, the, the everything now that's involved from transfer portal to NIL, there's so many outside factors that, you know, Tennessee didn't have to deal with back in the day. Now it was still hard because winning basketball games, winning one basketball game is so hard. And, and that's what I don't know if people understand that there's so many hours and so much work that just goes into one win. And, and so that's where I always tell our players and our staff, we're going to enjoy you know, when like you have to, you have to be proud and you have to enjoy that. And then the next day you move on, but um, you know, sustained success is obviously the goal and the vision and, and to continue. I want this program to be a top 25 program, you know, consistently. And then this, this league obviously is really hard now. Now you put in UCLA and USC. I mean, think about how hard it is. It's going to be to win a big 10 championship. Like, it's like almost impossible, right? Like so many things have to go right throughout the season. So um, obviously that we always at Dayton said we want to compete for championships and, and, you know, every year we want the same goal here, but it's just, it's hard. So I think you got to, it to sustain it, obviously, like we want to be a, a top 25 program, but then to get into the NSA tournament and then see what happens once you get in and, and be able to make a run in there. 
Um, so those are things that, you know, our goals and our vision for this. And, and, and that has to do with, as you know, you, you have to have really good players and, and that's where, you know, hopefully the, the winning and, and winning a little bit this year and some of the success that we're having now will open up like, Oh, we can do this at Illinois. You know, if, if we can go here and if I'm a top player, I can come here and play in a really fun system and, and play fast, you know, get to shoot uh, a lot and, and, and be able to compete at the, the highest level and win. And that's where we're trying to change, you know, that perception because they haven't had that success. So, um, you know, that, that's our, that's our goal. That's our vision every single day, just to get 1% better. And then hopefully the outcomes take care of themselves with, you know, again, top 25 program, you know, competing in the big 10 and, and then making runs in the NCAA tournament. Well, goodness knows you've begun to change that perception already back in the summer, you said, and uh, our Eric Reinston Lobel over at the next quoted you, everyone's going to think we suck. That's <laughs> good. Let them think that nobody thinks that anymore. So <laughs> that has changed nice and fast. Uh, Shauna Green, I appreciate your time. Our listeners, Make sure you I, I my Big Ten Plus subscription is maybe my favorite thing. And coming up on Sunday at uh, 2 p.m., you guys are at the barn in mm -hmm. Minneapolis, Williams uh, Arena, uh, dealing with Mara Braun and that group of freshmen. Make sure you tune in. I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, a big thank you uh, on behalf of all our listeners and a reminder tomorrow, make sure you tune in. The great Jackie Powell will be hosting M. Adler talking about WNBA free agency, which is coming fast and furious. Until then, I'm Howard Megdahl, founder and editor of The Next, wishing you all a wonderful Thursday. Welcome to Wallet. For the win. You are locked on women's basketball. Your daily podcast on women's basketball.